Usually sermon titles are, well, just kind of titles, not much. Today, the sermon title matters. I need you to hear it very closely. Wesley's very impractical sermon on money. Impractical being the key word. So, but he, he does preach an amazing sermon that I'm bringing to us today. And he, in the middle of doing this, he gives a way to read a passage that is frankly one of the most confusing I have found to be in Scripture. Because we have the story of the dishonest manager, manager the scuzzball, right? He takes the, uh, the debts of, his, of the funds that he, he's been entrusted with and, and he starts giving away discounts so that he can get ahead when he, after he's been caught. And it comes to this uh, amazing thing where Jesus is, is uh, praising him and praising him for using mammon, which uh, this is the old term that's translated here as dishonest wealth, but that, that wonderful old term mammon, which has that sense of uh, money that has that, the attractiveness that is bad for our, ourselves, the way that we're, we can lust after money. Right? And so... Wesley comes to this passage, and he talks about how it forms our use of money, and he doesn't just do it once. This is one of the passages he, he preaches all the time. He preaches this 27 times between 1741 and 1758. Now, he keeps on coming back to this again and again and again. And, and so to, to read... To, to read the punchline again and, and try to unpack what it means for us, uh, and let, we'll read it in the King James because that's what Wesley would have been reading. And the Lord commended the unjust su steward because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon, of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, that they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So Wesley takes this and points out that, yes, the children of this world, i.e. those who are not Christians, are far more uh, apt to talk about money because when in churches people talk about money, it hasn't changed. 300 years ago when you talk about money, everyone went, eek, right? Still do it, right? So we, we don't talk about it and uh, we get nervous. But uh, John reads on a bit further and, and says... Make yourselves friends, right? Be neighborly. Be, use your money for the good uh, of others, for it is something entrusted to you by God, right? And so use it even though it has this bit of attraction to it. He calls it mammon. He calls it straight out that there is this attraction we can have that is not healthy. But <coughs> it is a resource meant to be used to make friends and to do on a very specific timeline, Soon, right? He says, before ye fail, and Wesley understands when it says, uh, before you fail, the ultimate failure being death, right? So before you die, make sure that you have used the money you've been entrusted with to uh, use it wisely to be neighborly, to help your, your family, to help your friends, to, to use it for the good uh, of others. So that, that's the sense of what Wesley's getting out of this. Wesley has a, a, a positive view of money. There's this habit we run across at times of, uh, uh, of sort of being dismayed, money being the root of all evil, and it's the love of money. The money itself is not the problem here. The money in the proper hands is the tool that we use to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and give a drink to the thirsty, to uh, put a roof above our heads and to take care of those who are sick. Right? That is what we use money to do. And so money is a fund it can be a fundamentally good thing. It's a tool. We just have to use it wisely. And Wesley observes, yes, if we were in the, the early church that was so spirit-filled that they could have all things in common, that'd be great. Not going to happen today, so let's just make sure we use our, our money wisely today. And he goes on to offer some very practical advice about how to use money, but before we get into that, I have to give you one of the biggest disclaimers I've ever given in this sermon. We have to pay attention to the time frame which Wesley lived, right? Because it changes uh, how, how we hear him. Wesley was born at the end of the agricultural period in American, not American, in human history, right? Wesley lived through the Industrial Revolution. And so think about what that would mean, right? If you were born into an agricultural setting in Britain, you were born on the family farm, and you had your family friends, right? And, and there were family friends that uh, you went, it wasn't just like you know someone you went to kindergarten with and maybe you know your parents. No, in this setting, you were, you were family friends with people down the road on the family farm that makes our century farms look positively young, 
right? Because you'd be going to school with kids who your great 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 grandparents went to school with their great 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 grandparents, right? And so there was a a, a way that um, the community was woven together that was just amazing. And it was also a farming community. And farmers always have lots of one thing and little of another. They always, always have lots of land, but almost no cash, right? Lots of land, no liquidity, no cash, no, no money, right? And so the safety net, the, the rainy day fund, the way that you got through life is, is you would raise your crop or your cattle or whatever it was, and um, you'd pay off whatever debts you had to pay off that year, and, and you'd make sure you have some grain to plant for next year, and do you have any money left at the end of the year? Nope, right? Because if something goes wrong, what are you going to do? walk down the road to your neighbor and ask them for help the same way they'd ask you for help, right? And, and so there was a very uh, low cash, very illiquid society that the, the safety net was based around your community. And then people start moving to the factories. While, this is all happening while Wesley alive. He lived uh, basically the span of the 18th century. Um, at the beginning of the 18th century, is mostly farmers, and then everyone starts moving to the city, to the suburbs, to the factories, and um, suburbs don't exist yet, sorry. They're moving to the cities and to the factories, and if you go to the factory, you don't know who you're living next to, right? What's your safety net if you work at a factory? It's not the friendships and the families around you, it's have you saved any cash? Right? It's your monetary reserves. And you have to save up money because you have to buy a house because you left the family farm behind. And, and so there was also a major shift in government that had not yet happened that makes it harder for us to hear what he's about to say. Uh, in his day and age, the idea of the government helping an individual had not been invented yet. The idea of retirement was still a century off. Otto von Bismarck, if I understand correctly, invented retirement uh, to hold off, it's in what we now call Germany, he invented it to hold off the pressures of the socialists who were pushing from the east, the, the sort of socialist movement that was starting to arise. And so he invented retirement so that he could offer something to his people so that they wouldn't yield the temptation to become socialists. And uh, he said it at 65. That might be a familiar age. Why did he say it at 65? Because no one lived to 65, right? So uh, the early retirement setup was kind of a jip. You have a far better setup today. Uh, you, you expect to live to 65. Um, but all, the idea of, of the government helping anyone was still far down in the future. The idea of, of, of help, all that stuff is, it hasn't been invented yet. And so Wesley has these three suggestions based upon his time frame that, uh, well, let me get, tell, you, tell them to you and we'll, we'll see what you think. First, he says, make every cent you can. Never heard that from the pulpit, have you? You should make as much money as you can. Go make as much money as you possibly can. Wesley regarded sloth as a sin. Laziness is something to be avoided. You get off your duff and you go work. Right? Wesley wanted people to work. You make money as long as you're not making money by harming yourself or harming your neighbor. All right, there is restrictions there. Uh, he points out it would be bad for a, for a doctor to uh, extend a person's pain so that they get more doctor's fees. So you make money as long as you are, as much as you are able, as long as it doesn't hurt your neighbor. Uh, even to the point of don't undercut your neighbor. If you're in business and your neighbor is in business and you undercut your neighbor's prices, how is he or she going to feed their families? And, and so, not a big fan of. of uh, <clears throat> what we would now call competition. Don't poach another person's employees because they, you are damaging your neighbor's business. But we should make all that we can by honest work and honest trade, working in such a way that does not hurt ourselves. So that, that's an easy one to argue. Y'all should go make more money. Any argument with that? That's not, not a hard sell, so to speak. Second, he says, don't waste money. Right? Make all you can, and then save all you can. Don't waste money, avoid excess, avoid gluttony. Cultivate an appreciation for what is simple and plain and wholesome. Right? So avoiding the obvious excess of wanting more and more and more, and the excess of wanting better and better and better. 
All right, some people want more and more and more. For me, I gotta admit, the temptation for me is I want better. I don't want a lot of things, but I like my things to be very nice. Yeah, Wesley got to me right there. That uh, To avoid needless frivolity of dress, costly pictures, expensive furniture, gardens that are not useful. Gardens that are not useful. Flower gardens. He would not approve of the master gardeners. Sorry. <laughs> Don't burn money on impressing others, keeping up with the Jones. Like, Wesley took this kind of to an extreme. You always, if you see pictures of Wesley, he always had long hair. Not because that was the, the fashion of the age, but because he allowed him to save money on haircuts. So he, he, he was kind of cheap. Right? He says this because he argues that if we, if we start to gratify certain desires, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy them, it just grows them. Right, and, I'll, and I, I know how this goes, right? Because once those Amazon boxes start showing up with the, from the UPS man, what do you want? Another little brown box, don't you? I do. Yeah, this is my own problem here. The more that we indulge, the more that we want to indulge, the more that we indulge. It's sort of, it's a, you never end up satisfied, you just want a little bit more. And uh, he argues that it'd be better for us to throw our excess into the sea than to go down that route of never-ending uh, indulgence. And argues that we need to look at doing this for our children and grandchildren too. Right? If we're going to shape ourselves to appreciate what is simple and plain and wholesome, don't, don't uh, warp our children or grandchildren in the same way. When it comes to inheritance, he goes further and he says, don't give people more money than they can handle. Right? Money can be a challenging thing to handle and be healthy about. If you give people more money than they can handle, what's going to happen? Ain't pretty, right? So you don't give, don't give people more money than, than they can handle, and if you still have some left over, give it, give it to God's work somewhere else, the church or a charity or something else. So that's his second rule, the second guideline. Make all you can. That's easy. Save all you can. Uh, that's getting challenging. It's his third one where he really steps on my toes. Give all you can. Make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. According to Wesley, if you've done the first two, but not the third, you, know, you might as well not have started. Right? Might, not, might as well not have started. Right? We are on earth not as owners, but as stewards, caring for something we are entrusted with, and what we are entrusted with is God's. We are commissioned to do God's will, f will with it, which is first that we provide for our own needs, eat, drink, etc., uh, house. And then we do the same for those in our household. And then after that, if we have money left, to do it for the people in our household of faith. Right? Make sure that anyone in the household of faith has the simple needs of their lives. And then if there's still something left after that, give that away so that others might have the simple needs in their lives. Asking as you do this, if you're not sure, uh, is this something that I would be rewarded in for heaven for doing? Right? Is this something that is obedience to scripture? So make all you can. Sweet. Save all you can. Huh? Give all you can. Right? It's that last one that Wesley had the hardest time convincing people to do. It's how Wesley himself lived. Right? He's zero balanced every year. Wesley would make some money during the year. He'd make sure he had food and drink. And then he gave away the rest. Every single year, the dude died with no money. Right? He, and he said if he had died with any money, he would have regarded it as theft from uh, those who were hungry. Wesley had a legitimate concern. I mean, he continued to preach this again and again. He had a legitimate concern because he was seeing the, the, as capitalism was taking off, as the Industrial Revolution was going ahead, um, as people were leaving the farms, some people were getting ahead and amassing wealth, and others were really falling behind. Poverty, as we know of it today, really was was created during Wesley's, that, that time period, right? This poverty where you have no land, you have no family, you just have nothing. And so <clears throat> Wesley's trying to grapple with that. And we, we hear what he has to say, and there's a real elegance to it, right? Make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And we can admit that uh, there are parts of it that Wesley is just dead on, right? The more that you feed certain indulgences, the more that you want to indulge, right? That, uh, so he is right on these things. But we have to struggle with how do we give when, you know, cars aren't cheap, 
I drive that green box and one day that green box is not going to start. I'm a bit of a car hypochondriac, I have to admit. It wasn't running right two weeks ago and I, was, I just knew I had some, this needed rotors worked on. I mean, I, I'm a car hypochondriac, but I know at some point I'm going to have to buy a new car, right? And, and then I have to have enough money on hand so that if, if my family has a health problem, I can pay a deductible twice, right? Because what if it happens in December? I got to pay it again in January, right? So I got to have 10 grand on hand for one deductible, another 10 grand if it happens at the end of the year. So I got to be able to have two health, deduct health insurance deductible. I got to be able to pay for at least one new car at some point down the road. And it sure would be nice to send my kids to college. Lynn Tech starts to look really good when I start thinking about cost, right? Good education. And, and then, I mean, that's all just what's coming soon. Then start thinking about retirement. Whew, right? Retirement. How do we even begin to think about retirement and 401ks and how do I balance uh, saving for that against giving all you can that Wesley asks of us? It says that this is the way that we use ma the mammon of unrighteousness to make friends that we may re be received into everlasting habitations, right? This all stacks up in a way that is challenging. It is very challenging to take this type of scripture and to read it well, because we have all these reasons about why we can't, and yet we know that we really should. I think we need to remember uh, that a sermon in the end is an act of persuasion. Uh, it is an act where the pastor gets up and attempts to persuade himself and others that there's a slightly better way to live. Right, this is the next step. Methodist, right? Slightly better, one step at a time. Uh, <clears throat> that there's a better way to live. I think that's the reason Wesley comes back to this passage again and again and again, 27 times. Uh, it, there's a line between persuasion and nagging, and uh, he might have crossed it on this one. But uh, it is worth considering. Uh, it's worth considering because I don't think anyone in this room is going to walk out of here today, buy in whole hog, and start zero balancing your year. I, I don't think any one of us is going to, you, you're going to make this much, and by the end of the year, you'll have lived on part of it and given away the rest. Because if we did that in this culture, within about four years, you'd be homeless. I, I'm fairly certain of that. But we all live in these different situations, right? Some of us will never retire. Some of us already have retired. Some of us live rather simply. Others of us str struggle with, uh, with our stuff. Do we own our stuff or does our stuff own us? Some of us already give rather gener generously. Others of us are not sure if we can. And so I think maybe the best thing to do after hearing such a, a sermon, and it's going to be a challenge for me to do this as well, especially since Olivia is not here and I'm going to have to go tell her about it, it is write down those three words. Make, save, give. And seriously, there should, might be a pencil. Grab a pencil or a pen. Write down those three words in your bulletin right now. Make, save, give. I'm sure you can remember the rest of it. Make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Okay. Got those written down. I, I invite you to, to listen to these three for a second and, and ponder. Are you making as much money as you can? Is there something you could be doing to be gathering more money without hurting yourself, without hurting neighbors? Right? Are you making as much money as you can? Are you saving all of you, all that you can? Are there indulgences that you need to analyze? This is where Andy needs to do some work. Are there indulgences you need to think about? Do you need to cultivate maybe an appreciation for things that are, are simpler? Yeah. And then giving all you can. Have you figured out a way to give and give well? Right? Whether it is a, way, a continuous giving to the church, whether it is giving to charities, whether it is doing work on your will. I've run across the idea of tithing on your estate. Isn't that an interesting idea? You just write a tithe into your estate. Top 10% of your estate goes to the church. Right? Which one of those do you want to work on? Don't do all three. It won't happen. Circle one, though. Which one do you want to work on? Go sit down over lunch. Make a plan and see what you can do. I encourage you to do this because this is the best way I've found 
to, to do as Jesus describes, to make to yourselves friends by the use of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when we fail, and we will, that we will be received into everlasting habitations. Amen.